Scottish. No one, no one is willing to admit it. Are you really, are you really Scottish? No. Stop waving then. You're weird. So, I, um, I was in Canada speaking and somebody shouted out from the crowd, are you the guy that does the voice for Shrek? And uh, I was just about to deal with that when someone from the other side shouted, no, he's the guy that looks like Shrek. And that... You shouldn't have laughed at that. You should not have laughed at that. You have let yourself down and your family for laughing at that. Um, I I love God and I also am a massive football fan. And uh, sometimes this causes a little bit of tension. I've got a friend called Derek who's a minister of a church, right? And he is a massive, massive Bolton fan. He's a massive Bolton fan. And basically, he got me tickets for Bolton against Chelsea. And we sat right next to this fence, right next to the fence. And behind the fence was all the Chelsea fans. And I was sitting with all the Bolton fans. In the first half, Bolton scored. And all the guys around me went crazy. And Derek, a minister of a church, he got up and he was going absolutely wild, right? And then with three minutes of the game to go, Chelsea equalized. And when Chelsea equalized, all the Chelsea fans got up. They were all going crazy. They ran over to the fence and they were screaming through the fence. I think they were saying, may your mother be blessed. Yeah, I think think that's what they were saying. It was something about mothers. And uh, they were... And they were going crazy. And my friend Derek, he stood up. He's like a bit agitated. He's a bit wild. He says, Derek, sit down. Yeah, you love God. You have a wife. You have children. Sit down. With the last kick of the game, Bolton, um, sorry, Chelsea scored. It's Bolton one, Chelsea two. All the Chelsea fans are dancing. Derek gets up and starts running towards the Chelsea fans. I think, what am I going to do? If I stay here, I'm going to be safe. If I go with him, that's going to be funny, yeah? And so I got up and I'm like going, Derek, come on, don't say anything you're going to regret. Don't say anything you'll be disappointed with yourself in the morning. And he got up against the fence and he was so angry. He just went, ah, I hope, I hope you get stuck in traffic. (laughs) I hope you get stuck in traffic. I don't want anything bad to happen to you. Just mild inconvenience, yeah? And it's like, (laughs) I love that. I love a little bit of chant. I am married to Tamsin. And Tamsin, when she was 30, I got her 30 special treats for her 30th birthday. 30 special treats. Number one, yeah? She went up in a hot air balloon. Come on, yeah. Number two, I let it come back down again, yeah. Because if you leave it up there, that's not a treat, is it? And uh, and all my friends were like, "What have you done?" I did all these crazy events. She wanted to go stock car racing. We went stock car racing. She wanted to go all these different places. We did that. Thirty special treats. And all my friends were like, "What have you done? What have you done? What are you gonna do when she's 50? And I'm like, oh, I've made a mistake. I've made a big mistake. 50 special treats, that is me. But then I realized I've got it sorted, I've sussed it, right? For her 80th birthday, I'm going to do 80 special treats, yeah? Number one, a bungee jump, yeah? And uh, that'll take care of the other 79, yeah? Won't need to worry about them. Won't need to worry about them. Honestly, I've just got back from America and I did that in America. They did not laugh, yeah? They did not laugh. They just looked at each other going, that's not funny. He's actually just said he's going to murder his wife. (laughs) But I'm glad to see that you do find murdering wives funny, yeah? Have a look at yourself. What have you become, yeah? I am so excited because um, I feel like I've got something I really want to... 
kind of just get out of my gut, out of my heart over to you today. And I really hope that, you know, you go with me on this. It's an amazing part of the Bible. I don't know if you can see it, but it's in John chapter 6. And these brilliant words. John chapter 6 and verse 5. Phenomenal. The Bible says, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. And Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they'd all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. I love this story. I love the story that Jesus did this incredible and powerful miracle. Amazing that Jesus spoke over those five barley loaves of fish and boom, everyone was fed. But today, I'm here to speak to your soul and talk to you about the miracle that happens before the miracle. The miracle that happens before the miracle. You see, we can get very excited about Jesus doing that incredible work. We can be excited about what Jesus did, the powerful move of sovereign move of God. But there was a miracle that happened before the miracle. That little boy had to get over himself. He had to get over himself. He had to get past his limit in thinking and then hand over what he had to Jesus. He could have allowed his limiting thinking to stop him from even beginning with this miracle because he could have easily put his packed lunch back in the bag and we would have never seen this powerful miracle. But he had to get past and over himself so that he could allow this miracle to happen. I'm a Scottish guy that's come here today to say to you, you need to get over yourself. You need to get over yourself. I'd love it if some people just got up and says, come on, mate. <clears throat> yeah, let's have some of that. No, the truth is, we all need to get over ourselves. Because, you see, Jesus was never going to be able to even start with that miracle until this little boy had got around and had passed his limited thoughts. You see, the greatest And first obstacle that you are going to need to get past in your life is not Satan, is not the demonic works of the evil one. The greatest obstacle and first obstacle that you're going to need to get over is you need to get over yourself. You need to get past yourself. Because we stop so many things happening in our mind. We limit things in our mind and we don't even give opportunity for God to do what he really wants to do because of the limitations that we've got in our mind. This little boy had three tempting limiting thoughts that he could have given into. The first limiting thought that this little kid could have given into was, oh, it's just too small. It's only a tiny little bit of bread. It's only a tiny little bit of fish. It's too small. And I'm, I'm praying to God at Nottingham today about being in this moment. And God starts to speak to me and say, Mark, there are some people in the venue. There are some people in the room that are saying to God, oh, my gift's too small. My talent's too small. I've not really got much to give. 
And God's saying, you need to get around and past yourself and hand it over to God and watch God do a powerful miracle. You need to get over and past your thinking. You see, I wrote this down as God said it, but I really believe that there is such gifting and such talent in this room. I believe that there are books in this room today. I believe that there are songs that have not been written that are in this room right now. And so many of us were like, oh, it's only a little small thing. It's not really that much. It's not a big deal. And we need to get past that thinking and hand it over to God. So I'm praying and God says to me, there's somebody in that room you're going to be in front of today. And Mark, they've got a little business idea swirling around in the back of their head. A little business idea. But they have kept on saying, it's only a small little idea. It's only a little daft thing. And here I am to say to you, is it's not up to you to decide whether it's small. You hand it over to God and watch what God will do with your business idea. Watch what God will do with your business idea. We hand it over to God and God, boom, he does an incredible miracle. I love this. I love this. A little lad, he needed to get past his limited thinking. Don't think it's too small. Just hand it over to Jesus. The second thought that he could have had is that he could have thought to himself, there's not enough to make a difference. There's not enough to make a difference. Can you imagine this little lad? He's looking at his fish and bread. He's looking at the thousands of people. He's looking at the fish and bread. He's looking at the thousands of people. He's thinking, there's not enough to make a difference. Oh, I got excited because God began to say to me, I'm driving in to Norwich today. I'm driving through all this whole community in this area. And I'm shouting to God. And I'm speaking in my car. And the room and the car is filling with the presence of God. And I'm beginning to get excited because we're saying, Well, you know, hey, this gathering here, this group of people here, Do you know, when we think of the massive city of Norwich, when we think of this whole wide community, There's not enough here to make a difference. And God speaking to me in the car and said that in this room, in this venue, if we hand ourselves over to God, watch what God will do. God can change the schools. God can change the community. God can change the pubs. He can change the nightlife of this whole area. If we hand over to God, God can make an incredible difference. It's not up for us just to go, oh, do you know what? There's only, how are we going to make a difference? Just the people in here. No. Wow. We hand it over to God. And God's like, this is powerful and unbelievable. And the difference that God can make. Amazing. You see, I don't want to limit God. I don't want to be putting my packed lunch back in the rucksack. I don't want you today to think, Oh, it's incredible. You know, I've turned up today. I'm looking around. I'm like, wow, God, you're on with something in this place. The momentum, this wave is wonderful. And it's like, yeah, and so many of us, because we can just be a bit like, oh, well, this is good. We're happy with this. But it's like, God, this is only the beginning. This is only the beginning. We're building up to something incredible where whole communities are going to be transformed. Whole areas are going to be completely turned around. You're thinking, oh, he's just a preacher saying a few words. But a little boy looks at his little bit of fish and bread. And he looks at the masses. And Jesus says, get over yourself. Hand it over to me. Oh, we're looking at this group of people. And we're saying that this whole area can be changed. I'm getting excited to think about them writing in newspapers about what God is doing amongst you guys. I'm getting excited to think about what God is doing and powerfully changing The community, wow, this little boy has to get over himself, has to get past his limiting thinking and hand it over to Jesus. Here's the third limiting thinking that this little kid could have had. He could have thought to himself, oh man, oh man, I I know where this food's come from. I know where this food's come from. It's not Master Chef. It's not Master Chef. This is my mum's cooking. It's a bit of fish and a bit of bread in the back kitchen. I said, this is not a 
a story that they're going to talk about for thousands of years. It's only a bit of bread in the back kitchen. It's only a little bit of fish that's kind of going off. What is this? And yet here we are. Here we are talking about it today. Because, you see, Jesus is not interested in where it came from. He's interested in where it's going. And, you know, I'm like looking at people today and they're saying to me, Oh, Mark. Oh, I'd love to do great things for God, but you don't understand. Mark, I'm not educated like some of the other guys. Mark, if you knew my, the housing estate that I come from. Oh, Mark, if you knew like well, how I've been brought up, the way things were in our family, the way things were on our street. If you knew those things, Mark, you would never call me a life changer. But listen, Jesus is not interested in where it's come from. He's interested in where it's going. And it's like, wow, he changes things and he radically multiplies things. It doesn't matter about your education. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what's going on in the past. He's here and he's in this place. And he's ready to multiply. He's ready to do an incredible miracle. And we're like, bring. See, so, yeah, let me tell you my little story. I, um, I, I went to Bible college. I went to Bible college. Everybody in Bible college wandering around, looking intense. Looking I thought, oh wow, everybody in Bible college looks like they need a poo. Just <laughs> bring release, Lord, bring release. And uh, let's move on. And uh, I was like, wow, I went to Bible college, I trained to be a minister. My mom and dad were church leaders. That was my deal. And then I started working for God and I started to talk to people about God. But everywhere I was going, I was speaking to Christians. So my wife booked me in to see this comedian. He was a guy called Dave Gorman. He's not a Christian, but he's got a very strong message. He's communicating a message. And I sat there and I could see he was very funny, but I could see that he was communicating a message. And God spoke to me and says, I want you to have a go at that. And I started saying to God, God, do you know where I come from? My mom and dad are pastors. I've been at Bible college for three years. I'm a preacher. I'm, what are you talking about? I'm telling God. God made me. Do you know what I'm saying? God made me. He knows me better than me. And I'm like... Oh. <laughs> and so... I share the vision with my wife. We book a theater. We book a theater in the outskirts of Nottingham. 70 people. And 70 people came, lots of them unchurched people. And I, I started to do this show. Now, guys, you need to know this. There were moments that were hilarious. People were slapping their thighs and wiping their eyes. There were other moments that were horrendous. <laughs> Have you ever had that moment, that tumbleweed moment, where, like, <gasps> where everybody does like a synchronized buttock clench, yeah? And people look at the ground. No one wants to give you eye contact. They look at the ground. Oh. But I went for it. Some of the stories were brilliant. Some of them were not great. But five people made a first-time response for God. Five people made a first-time response for God. I was so buzzing. I was excited. And at the end, I had asked this minister to come and see it because it was the first time I was doing it. He came to the front. And he said this. He says, what are you doing? He says, Mark, what was that? That was embarrassing. Stop. Do you want to be on TV? Is this what this is? He says, get back to preaching in churches and stop being foolish. He says, this is rubbish. He says, it was embarrassing. And out he walked. Have you ever had one of those moments where you're like, thanks for the feedback? Yeah, have you ever had <laughs> Da, 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 thank you. And so I'm driving home with my wife, and Tamsin is excited because she saw five people respond and she loved it. She says it was so engaging, it was great. And I says, I'm never doing it again. She goes, What do you mean you're never doing it again? And I told her what that minister had said. My, I don't know if you've ever seen your husband or wife 
or your partner so angry that the vein in their neck actually comes out of their body and wanders around the car? Have you ever seen that? <sighs> she said, listen to me. I looked up to God and God was like, I would listen to her. Yeah, I would. God said, I'm listening to her, so you should listen to her. Yeah. She goes, listen to me. She says, Mark, it is true that there were some stories that you should never say again out loud. She goes, but we'll, we'll work on that. She goes, we'll work on that. But she goes, Mark, you were up there. You were engaging. People were loving it. She goes, five people responded. She says, we are doing this again. And so we started to do it around theatres all around the UK. And the theatres got bigger and greater. And then I did it in Lincoln. And there was 800 people in the theatre. And 120 people made a first-time response to God. 120. Wow! Amazing! But what I didn't know, what I didn't know was that guy, that minister, that leader, he was in there. He was at the back. And at the end, he came around the front and he comes up to me and he's like, wow, you must keep doing this. And I was looking at him. I'm thinking as soon as he stops talking, I'm going to let him have it, yeah? I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him that, oh, if I'd listened to you, I would never have done it again. If I'm, I was ready for all that. And God was like, no, no. Come on, Mark. You're the bigger man. Fingers on lips. Fingers on lips. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. And off he went. And now I talk about him all over the world, yeah? And uh, obviously... Never use his name. Never use his name, but praise the Lord. But you know, my background, my background, being a Bible college student, being a pastor, would have meant that I was like saying to God, limiting, limiting, limiting. This is what I've got to do. For the, and now I'm doing all these shows at comedy festivals. This summer, I was doing my one-man show at the Edinburgh Fringe, just near the Edinburgh Castle. And listen to this, when I was 16, I lived in Musselburgh, and there I was living on the outskirts of uh, Edinburgh. I used to go up to the fringe, and every year, every year, I would hear comedians on a stage absolutely ripping the name of Jesus to shreds, absolutely ripping Christianity, tearing it up, laughing at it, calling it all kinds of names. And as a 16-year-old boy in the middle, I sat there, and I thought, one day... I'm going to be on that stage and I'm going to lift up the name of Jesus. I'm going to lift up the name of Jesus. I'm going to lift his name up. And this summer, there it was. People coming in, they saw in the program, they got a flyer on the Royal Mile and in they came and we laughed and we had fun. And then, wow, the presence of God, a sacred moment. And what an unusual place in the middle of a comedy show, the presence of God. Wow. You see, I'm telling you guys, is that we've not to limit God with our limiting thinking. I had to get over myself. Where my background, I'm a pastor's kid, I'm a Bible college student, I'm just a priest. No, I had to get over myself and I had to hand it over to God. And look what God has done. Wow. See, the second thing that I really want to say from this story is that not only this little kid, he hands it over and Jesus is there. I love this story. If I had been in that story, I would have been shouting from the side. I'd have shouted to Philip. I would have shouted to Andrew, the disciples. I would say, guys, open your eyes. Open your eyes. Salvation is here. Phil, Philip, Andrew, these guys are all like mocking around about the logistics. You know, when I'm, oh, there's not enough, there's not enough food, and Tesco's is shot, and uh, it's like, what are we going to do? Open your eyes, salvation is right in front of you. He's like the son of the living God. He made bread, he made fish, yeah, he made all the people, and he made Tesco's, so it's like everything's cool. <laughs> Open your eyes, salvation is here. They didn't even understand that right in front of them was salvation. Ah, oh, friend, tonight, open your eyes. Salvation 
is here. You see, I'm aware in a room like this that there are people who have drifted from God. I know that during the, this music, some of us were trying to wrestle with where we are with this whole thing. We seem so far from God. You see, some of us have drifted from God. We never set out for it. We never shook our fist at God and said, I hate you, God. But life and our decisions and stuff's just happened. And now we've drifted from God. And here we are. It's like, what do we do? God's here. And it's like, ah. It's like, open your eyes. Salvation is here. I was in Australia a few months ago and I was chatting to the lifeguards and I I, I got a really great chat with them and I I was on the Gold Coast and I couldn't believe these waves. I went out into the sea and the wave whipped me, took me right my feet away and it was like a washing machine. And I was chatting to these guys and they were like talking about the eddies and the tide. And then they spoke about this girl, this nine-year-old girl two weeks before I got there, two weeks before, this little nine-year-old girl was in the sea and a wave totally took her out. And she's quite a strong swimmer, but the tide and the eddies and the, and the rip curl, all of them together, they were pulling her and she was going down. And these lifeguards said they couldn't get to her because of the waves. They ran out and they were trying to get to her because of the waves, but they couldn't get to her. And the only thing that they could do was they had this thing they call a rescue can, you know, a flotation. And they threw it towards the ghetto. And she's getting thrown all over the place. And they are shouting as loud as they can. But the waves are so noisy. And this flotation is right next to her. But she's nine. And she's swirling around. And you can see she looks at it a couple of times. But she's not grabbing it. She doesn't understand. Open your eyes. Salvation is here. If you only were to understand, put your hands on it and you will be saved. And I says, and what happened? What happened? They says, we were shouting the loudest we could shout. We were pointing. We would do everything. And then suddenly one of these times she goes down and it looks like she's not coming back up. But then she comes up and it's like she has a light bulb moment. And she grabs hold of the flotation and they're able to pull her in and they were able to rescue her. Friend, God is in this place. The presence of God is here. And God sees people in this room that are drifted from him. The Bible says that God so loved you so much that he gave. He gave his only son, the cross of Jesus. We were celebrating it a few minutes ago in that beautiful communion time. That the cross, and so many of us will look at the cross and it looks like a religious symbol or it looks like something on a book. It looks like some old fuddy-duddy thing. And yet, friend, if only you could understand that God has thrown the cross out to you, that if only you would come through the cross, he could pull you in and you could be reunited with God and that you could connect with God again. That today, friend, all I'm saying to you, salvation is here. That you could come through. Come through the beautiful cross and be found in God's arms again. And at the end, in a few minutes, I'm going to get the great privilege of just giving everyone in this place an opportunity that they could maybe pray a prayer and that they could come through the cross and be home again in the arms of God. The third thing I wanted to say about this story was the final thing I want to say about it. And it's simply this, is that I love that this story is a story of abundance. It's a story of overflow. You see, I laugh at this because have you ever been to a birthday or a barbecue or a wedding when there wasn't quite enough food? Have you ever been to that? And it's like everyone's been nice. No, no, we don't mind the whole 50 of us. We can share a sausage roll, yeah? We are we not? Horrible. And I love that this miracle is not God working out exactly. Oh, and there's one packet of crisps here. And that's perfect because there's only three teenagers left. But no, 
guess what? The Bible says that everybody had enough to eat. This is a miracle. There were teenagers at that event, yeah. And there was enough for everyone to eat. And overflow, overflow. You see, I love this because I'm learning some lessons in life. And one of the lessons I'm learning is simply this, and I hope you can grab this. You can hold on to your blessings and live a life of scarcity. Or you can give your blessings away and live a life of overflow. You can give your blessings away and live a life of overflow. Oh, wow. I want to live a life of overflow. I want to be blessed and everybody that comes near me, I want to be give away, give away, give away. I don't want to be like holding tightly onto what I've got and live a life of scarcity. I want to live a life of overflow. Do you know what my wife and me, that's lovely, where's it? When the keyboard player starts playing, that's his lovely Christian polite way of saying, that's enough now, yeah? Okay, I think we've, I think we've heard enough. I think, I think we're going to wrap that up now, yeah, we're going to wrap that up. And this happens to me every church I go to, every church keyboard player, okay, okay, okay. And I thought that was bad. But now my wife has got one at home and she plays the cable. Okay, Mark, that's enough now, yeah. Let's call that a wrap, yeah. Sorry about that. You see, we can live a life of overflow. Do you know what my wife and me have started doing? We're in restaurants and we buy a couple over there. We buy their meal. We pay for the meal. And they look over and they're like, do you know who that is? I don't know who that is. And they're looking over. Why have they paid for a meal? Now you've got to understand something. I am not sitting at the table going, boom, boom, boom. Jesus died for you, yeah? I am not. It's not an evangelistic opportunity. All I'm doing is, I want to be a blessing. I want to live a life of overflow. Oh, friend, that you would not hold on tightly to scarcity but that you would be someone that gives away overflow and yeah I'm finishing and I'm so excited that I get a chance in a few minutes to do my comedy show that I did at the Edinburgh Fringe you guys are letting me do it here tonight and I hope this so I'm going to have a lot of fun it's going to be silly nonsense but it's going to be fun but I hope you don't mind as I'm bringing this to an end that I just speak to your soul for one minute. See, my son, he came into our front room and he found me sobbing. He found me sobbing on the floor. He said, Dad, Dad, what's happening? And I said, Son, I'm, I'm watching this. And what I've been watching I was watching this video. I was watching this video about Grenfell Tower. So many of you know about those flats that went up in flames and people losing their lives and horrible. And I saw this video and they showed a little huddle. And this little huddle, they got those survival blankets on, you know those foil blankets, they got them around them and they were speaking quickly to each other, they had just been rescued from the tower and they were all speaking excited and they were in a little huddle and they were talking about how the firemen came in and the firemen rescued them and the camera is on this huddle and then the camera pulls back and you see that the building is still burning. The building is still burning. People are running away from the building. It's still on fire. And it goes back to this little huddle. And they've got the survival blankets on. And then suddenly one of them stands up. And he tears off the survival blanket. And he throws it to the ground. And then he just starts running towards the building. 
He starts running towards the building and then a few minutes later, you see him with a fireman helping out an old lady out of these flats. And when somebody interviewed him, he said these words, I suddenly realized, I suddenly realized I've been rescued to see others rescued. I suddenly realized that I've been rescued to see others rescued. You see, friends, I'm nearly finished, but I go to a lot of churches and they're in a little huddle. They've got their little survival blankets on and they're saying, oh, we're just waiting until you come back, Jesus. They're sharing stories with each other of how they were rescued 35 years ago and they're singing amazing grace. But friends, the world is still burning. The world is still burning. Broken, ruined, and devastated. And I'm speaking to your soul today that there would be many of us that would rise up, that we would take off the survival blanket, that we would say, do you know what? We are not here to survive till Jesus gets back. But we are here to bring rescue to a broken generation. We are here to bring rescue to a devastated nation. We are here to bring rescue to a desperate, desperate world. Oh, God. Rescued to see others rescued. I'm nearly finished. You grab your seat for a second. I'm nearly finished. But you know, when I'm driving home today, I'm going to pray that you have a Christmas program. Because you guys have got such a cool and incredible thing going on here. But what I love the most is you are not doing a Christmas program so that you can all rub each other's backs and say how great you are. But you are putting a Christmas program on that is running to the broken and the devastated and the ruined. That you are running to the damage. That you are saying, oh, we want you to be rescued. We want you to be rescued. People say to me, why do you do, why do comedy shows and festivals? I got the chance I had five amazing emails come through, four of them from big churches in America, one of them from a pub in East Belfast, all of them asking me to do my show. And you need to know I had lots of reasons why it would have been cool to have done the four in America. But God says, Mark, I need you to go and take the gospel to the place where people least expect it. I need you to go into that pub in Belfast and communicate the gospel and see many rescued in the name of Jesus. Oh, I'm going to hand over in just a couple of minutes. But before I do, I sense God's presence so real. I wonder if you could for a moment just bow your head. You see, I believe that all over this room there are people that have drifted away. And God is here. And he's throwing the rescue line. He's throwing that rescue line out to you. And what I'm going to ask you to do, friend, wherever you're sitting, I'm going to pray a really short prayer. I'm going to ask that you pray it after me. Don't say it out loud so people can hear, but just pray it in your heart. I'm then going to say amen. And when I say amen, every eye will be bowed and every head will be closed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. And I'm going to say, if you prayed that prayer, then what I'm going to ask you to do is to slip up your hand tonight. Slip up your hand. And I will see that hand. And I will know that you have said yes to that incredible rescue. God throws out his son to you. This is the prayer. Why don't you pray, wherever you are, why don't you pray this after me? Oh God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that Jesus is my rescue. I'm sorry for drifting away. I come now. Pull me into your arms. Pull me into your arms. I want to connect with you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
every head stays bowed for a moment, every eye is closed. I'm just going to say that if you prayed that prayer, I want you to stick up your hand. And number three, I want you to put up your hand big and strong so I can see it. One, two, three. That's amazing. That is really great. Wonderful. People all over the venue. That is amazing. Wonderful. Wonderful. I, th- I keep those hands up for a minute. I believe that there are one or two others that just quickly need to just stick up their hand. You've not got your hand up, but you need to stick it up. Just quickly do that. Just quickly do that. That is amazing. That is wonderful. That is so incredible. We're excited. We're excited. Oh, Lord. Wonderful. You can just take your hands down and the guys will chat at the end. But before, before we finish would it be okay for me to pray for a church that's thrown the survival blanket down and run into a broken generation would that be okay ah church if you feel okay I wonder if while I'm praying if you could stand and I wonder if you feel comfortable with this if you could raise up your hands to heaven because I've got a prayer inside of me I've got a prayer inside of me because God holy God Oh, Father God, we love what you're doing here. We love what you're doing here. But God, we are so aware that the building is still burning. We're so aware, God, that our world is still broken and ruined and devastated. God, we're still aware that the generation, but all the young generation for so fractured and so devastated. We're so aware, God, that there are families all around this area broken and bruised. And God, as our hands are raised to you now, Father, we do not want to be in a huddle. We do not want to just be telling each other stories of how we got rescued. But God, we throw off the survival mentality and we go and we run to a broken and devastated world. And as these hands are up in the air, I'm praying for souls this Christmas. I'm praying for souls, masses and masses of souls, many rescued, lives rescued, families rescued, people turned around in the name of Jesus. I'm praying as hands are raised that salvation would spring up. Salvation would spring up from the ground. Your presence is here. Anoint us to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom to the captive. In Jesus' name, Jesus. Thanks for joining with us today. We hope you felt inspired by the word that came through today. That's right. And, you know, if you really felt something in your heart, if you call Soul Church your spiritual yeah. home, And that means you're part of our online community. You're listening right now uh, via podcast, iTunes. We really want you to prayerfully consider the part that you can play. Maybe you can help us, support us. So if you can, head to soulchurch.com. And uh, we know that there is a miracle about to break out with our new building and blessing those who are in a a greater need than ourselves. So thank you in advance for the part that you're going to play. God bless.